Presently, uh, I'm at Baker McKenzie and I'm the head of the services organization. So what is the services organization? So the services function really provides or combines five key disciplines within the law firm to connect the capabilities that bring you closer to the client. And so if you think for a minute about law firms providing legal services to their clients, very important, but equally as important is really engaging that client where they are to deliver those legal services. And that's really been the push lately um, in a lot of the legal buy. And so underneath this function, this organization right now is about 600 people, just so you know. Um, it's alternative legal services, business management, which is really about driving the economic engine of our different practices, legal project management, pricing strategy, and you heard a little bit from uh, Jay yesterday about some of the data visualization, but she heads up our pricing strategy. Service design, which is really all about how do we actually go about developing new services, new products, new um, uh, service lines to meet our clients, and then alternative legal services, which we have based in Manila, Tampa, and uh, Belfast today. Uh, so this is the organization today um, to help drive what we're doing within the law department. So I want to talk a little bit about headlines we've seen in the publications uh, as of recent days. And we see a lot of the talk about how the law uh, department function is actually changing quite a bit. Um, where we have uh, fewer hires, how to control costs, alternative dispute resolution, um, what are we doing in terms of uh, improved management reporting and technology. Here's the thing though, <clears throat> all of these headlines actually are from 1992. Okay, We have actually been talking about this stuff for a really, really, really long time. Um, and haven't seen a lot of move and a lot of change lately. I want to talk a little bit about that. I think one of the things we'll talk about is why law firms actually didn't adopt some of this stuff earlier uh, as part of the journey and why they're doing so now. We'll also talk about the legal operations space on the corporate side because I think that informs a little bit of what we're doing. Um, since 1993, law departments have spent over $3 billion on core technology. Law departments, excuse me. Matter management, spend management, IP management, managing claims, practice type management stuff, all sorts of different technologies. Um, but let's talk about questions to consider with that $3 billion in spend. Number one is generally is the life of the clients, attorneys, or paralegals any better? Uh, are the organizations better able to manage their functions and give insights? Does the firm or client actually have better information about making more strategic uh, decisions about the work they're doing or the risk they're managing? And I will tell you the answer is a resounding no. So after $3 billion in spend in all these organizations, we're still pretty much stuck where we were uh, many times, uh, many, many, many time ago. One of the other things I do is for the last 11 years, I've been running a survey of law department operations folks. And uh, we ask lots of questions about how they view the world. Um, and so I've interspersed some of the data from here. In 2014, we asked the question, do law firms leverage technology to le deliver legal services more effectively and efficiently? And in 2014, 43% agreed, 57% um, disagreed. Anyone want to venture a guess what happened in 2017? Did, um, did more people agree or disagree? What number? What happened to the agree number? Well. I'll tell you, it's actually remained relatively flat. And so the needs could change in the law department, the complexity is changing, and yet the client's view of what's happening, and these are operations folks living in corporations, it's relatively flat. That's pretty abysmal, actually, if you think about it in a three-year period. Think about if you would accept the same cell phone or mobile phone you had in 2014 and 2017, you'd be pretty disappointed about that. Um, all right, do me a favor, if you would. I'd like everyone to cross their arms for me. Okay? Good. Now, I'd like you to do that again, but switch your hands and do it in the opposite direction. He's still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Why is that so hard? Muscle reflex, maybe, yes? Power of, habit. Power of habit, big part of it. It's essentially the exact same task. It accomplishes the exact same thing 
and yet we're all sitting there trying to figure out, hmm, what should I do, right? Change is hard. And habits actually live deep in our brains and they make things feel uncomfortable and we don't like to do them. Something as simple as folding your arms gives you an example of why when I'm trying to change an entire ecosystem or trying to change an entire world, why it can be very hard. <clears throat> okay, let me ask you a question. If I said you have to change or die, you think you could do it? This isn't a death bread or anything. The truth is actually, no, you can't. 90% of the people can't change. There was a study done of people who just uh, were recovering from a heart attack. And the study was done in a medical journal and says, look it, if you don't change your habits, and they kept track of it, you will die. 90% of the people who were in that study could not actually change what they were doing. I want you to think about that. Death was on the line, and they could not change. Okay, let me give you another story. Uh, let's say we have a global financial institution. They have a sizable law department, sizable outside counsel legal spend. They have law department technology, some of it underpinned by Outlook or Office or document management, okay? They track their matter activity and spend in a Microsoft Word document or an Excel. Task takes approximately one week uh, each month to collect and to collate and to distribute the required information from virtually every law department that they work with, okay? How is this rational, if you think about what we're trying to do? Uh, these problems really shouldn't ar arise. Why is that? Well, all people are rational, supposedly, right? If you think about economic theory, all people are rational. Individual choices should actually be consistent with utility, minimizing pain. And people, uh, people actually correctly update their opinions and beliefs based on information that has actually been received. I don't like doing this every month. Why am I doing it this way every month? You would think they would actually change that. Well, we see this in our lives every day as well, right? So someone making $50,000 a year can uh, join a 401k program in the United States, and the company will actually match up to 6% of your contributions. That's an additional $3,000 a year just for doing the act of saving money, right? Um, the rationale model unequivocally predicts that people will certainly snap up as much of that opportunity as they can, thinking because, look it, they don't want to, it's free money, so why not do it, right? And there's no downside and huge upside. Casino gamblers, anyone gamble here, right? Um, how many people are willing to keep betting even though you're expecting to lose, right? How many people have said, ah, it's just my entertainment for the night, I, I expect to lose it all? We do it all the time, but we're gambling that money away. That's not a rational decision. And people say they want to save for retirement, eat better, they want to start exercising, quit smoking, and they all mean it, but actually they really don't do it. Economic man supposedly makes logical, rational, self-interested decisions and they weigh the costs and benefits to maximize the uh, profits and the value to himself or herself. That's traditional economic theory, okay? They're intelligent, they're analytic, selfish creature who has perfect self-regulation in pursuit of their future goals and is unswayed by bodily states and feelings, okay? Traditional definition of uh, economic theory. Here's the problem. Rational man doesn't exist. We don't live in a world of rational people. People make decisions every day in the practice of law. They make decisions every day about the risk and the value they're trying to provide for their organizations, but they're not rational decisions, which is why making change is so very, very hard in the whole um, legal sphere. Actually, behavioral economic theory really gets to the heart of what's happening here. People make systematic uh, choices and mistakes due to the psychological blind spots we all have around change. Um, and the context in which a decision is made has actually an effect, uh, an enormous effect on that particular decision. And so they've actually done studies, for example, um, that based on your last input about what you've heard, uh, last number you've heard, you will actually change actually the, the, um, the value you're willing to pay for something. And so one of the studies they did is they put a cup in front of the room uh, and they asked the students what would they be willing to pay for that particular cup. Okay, just an ordinary average cup. Before they did that, they had them write down um, the day of the month in which they were born. Okay? 
And so they put down the day of the month, and what they showed is the people who had a higher day of the month in uh, which they were born actually were willing to pay higher for that cup than the people who had a, a, a number earlier in the month. Again, we take these inputs from our brain when we're making these decisions, and that has impacts on how we're trying to drive the change. Okay, $268 billion is actually the approximate amount of money that's spent on legal services on an annual basis. Okay? $7 billion of that, that's the size of bet the company or big market lawsuit stuff. So everyone's chasing after the big piece of work out there, but the bulk of it actually isn't that. Less than 3% of it actually makes up um, the bet the company type of the stuff where people have no care about the cost, no care about how it's delivered. They just need it done quickly and effectively. 70%. In the most recent study out there, 70% is actually the percentage of GCs that are actually dissatisfied with their primary law firms that they're using today. 1231, anyone know what that is? It doesn't apply to Baker McKenzie, but it does apply most everywhere else. It's actually the date each year in which lawyers think all of a sudden they're magically more valuable and they're worth more to their clients, therefore they're going to raise the rates, right? And they use that as a way of saying, hey, we're going to justify the rate increase. Something magical happens on December 31st of every year. 10% is the average hourly rate increase that's requested of a corporate law department year over year. Zero. Anyone want to guess what zero is? It's the amount of efficiency gain actually seen by the clients. Uh, in corporate law departments in law firm buildings for more experienced and more valuable resources. They don't see anything for it. Minus 5%. So in the face of a 10% increase, minus 5% actually represents the normal corporate annual adjustment to the law department budget across all functions and all suppliers that enter into um, work with that particular organization. 145K US dollars is the medium income associate salary across all law firms. 90K is actually what it is in-house. Now, this is changing a little bit, but that's the average inside council uh, compensation. 688. 688 actually represents the approximate number of law firm mergers over the last 10 years. So we're seeing a consolidation in the market, and typically when you see a consolidation, you're thinking, ah, if they consolidate, they're going to become more effective and more efficient, right? Well, no, it doesn't work that way. This is the amount of savings clients have actually seen from those mergers, those 688 mergers. This is the amount of savings on post-merger cost reductions that have been passed to the clients in those 10 years. Zero. None. 1,300. 1,300 is the actual normal annual billable hours in 1958. 2,200. That's actually the common 2017 annual billable hour target for most law firms. 95%, um, still 95%, the hourly rate is still the most common compensation model used by corporations. This is interesting because of all the barking you hear from inside council folks about we want alternative fee structures, we want a different way of doing it, all of them chicken out and they still go at the uh, hourly rate and we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. 95% is still the most common. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about challenges facing uh, legal departments. So across law departments, all across the um, uh, corporate America and corporate in the multinational corporates, look at they're having a hard time defining and articulating value to their C-suite. Uh, there's a growth in number in legal operations professionals, but I will tell you there are varying degrees of sophistication. Uh, and it's important that you know that because as you deal with them in your career, it's important to know they're not all the same. Uh, there has been um, 20 years ago when I started legal operations, there was a handful of people doing it. A handful of us are still doing it. As it's gotten more popular, you've seen a lot more people enter into that space. But because there really is no formal training, what you see is people who have been in it a really long time and are very sophisticated buyers of legal and people who are just starting out in that particular role who aren't as sophisticated, and there's a big gap in the middle. And so you have to actually have an understanding of who it is you're dealing with in the corporate law department, how much influence do they actually have uh, on that law department and the buying decisions as you're working through your careers. Um, 
Overburdening legal staff is a big thing. Trying to find the right delivery model of internal and external resources, leveraging knowledge, and then really establishing appropriate metrics to actually show value. If you think about it for most, most companies, the legal function is a non-core function of that company. Legal operations, by the way, is a non-core function of the non-core function that your company works in. So if you don't think that people are going to be watching you, they actually are because they want to know what they're spending their money on. Um, maybe you've seen this. I don't know. But the growth complexity trade-off, have you seen this? I'm seeing heads nod. OK. And really, the headline here is this, right? That for every dollar value of um, revenue growth that I see, you expect that I'd have a linear growth in terms of uh, complexity for my organizations. I don't. It actually is more like a hockey stick. It goes up exponentially, not incrementally. And so you saw the rise of large law firms there. You see higher profits. Uh, you see searches for quality uh, for substitutes. Because the other thing that you don't see here is that while the growth and complexity is going up, most budgets are actually coming down. So my organizations are getting more and more complex, and they're being asked to do more and more with less. Um, there's been some studies out there that actually look at regulatory filings in the United States, uh, and I think it's a good analog, to talk about the complexity of our organizations. Over the last 10 years, right, regulatory references in 10K filings have actually quadrupled. So if you think about it, that, the number of things I actually have to reference in those filings has gone up fourfold. Um, the number of and variety of regulations in, in that uh, 10K filing have actually tripled. And so again, government regulation, uh, the businesses I'm in, the fact that I'm in more jurisdictions, uh, all are driving to the complexity of what a law department is having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're looking for people to help them find solutions. And legal operations tried to make sense of all this. On top of that, we have new entrants into the legal tech um, space. It's about $133 billion marketplace right now. And you have new law, tech, law, and tech law and legal process outsourcers out there, and those are the different players. Why? Because people are actually trying to find substitutes for a lot of the work they've done. And I'm sure you've read and heard some of this. Um, the other thing that's happening is a lot of law departments are actually doing it yourself. They're saying, look, no longer can I rely on my law firms to do all this for me. It's just too expensive. And you see the headlines, and these are actually headlines, and I dated them this time. But uh, law firm spend is rising, but it's actually rising in different entrants to the marketplace. Uh, in-house law departments keep growing. Corporations keep adding to their in-house because they're, they're at the point where the make versus buy decision is heavily weighted towards the make. Do it yourself. Keep it in-house. And I'm sure you've seen this, but actually over the last 10 years in the United States, we actually see a 203% increase uh, in in-house lawyers. It's tripled giving rise to or some insight into what's actually happening out there in actual hiring. OK, so legal operations. We talk a lot about it, and we talk about what it is. If you think about legal operations at the center, a lot of what they do around it is what a lot of legal operations folks, from uh, vendor management to data analytics to global uh, data and e-discovery products, lit support, cross-functional alignment, dealing with all those People who talk numbers and math to a law department doesn't generally work well, so you have your ops folks do it. Uh, knowledge management. <clears throat> and actually, if you think about the three things they do in large buckets, they align legal department priorities. They represent the organization cross-functionally because they tend to be uh, that connecting point from the law department to the business and the law department to the C-suite. Uh, and then they build strong outside provider, outside counsel or outside provider relationships because there's a lot of... Uh, calorie burn and friction that happens in that uh, relationship. Even if you don't want it to have a lot of friction and calorie burn, it happens. And so having to deal with that and deploying tools to manage that, a very big part of what they do. OK, back to uh, my survey. Let me ask this. In 2008, here are the top challenges that were existing for law department operations folks. Identify opportunities for business management improvement. Show value of the proposition, or of the position rather, uh, to the organization. Obtain funding to do projects within the law department, and obtain funding to do resources. This is 2008, which is one of the first years we did the survey. Okay, 2017. Here are the four things: identify opportunities for business improvement, 
manage outside counsel, drive and implement change, and contain costs. So let's see what orders uh, that actually came in. Um, you see, number one was to actually drive and implement change. A lot of what the operations function in-house is doing is trying to drive and implement change. Well, if you think about that, if that's one of their main focuses and goals, who do you think they're going to turn to to help drive and implement change with them? It's their law firms, right? Number two is actually to contain costs, so it still remains fairly high on the list, but not as much as driving change. Number three is identify opportunities for business improvement and cost savings. And then number four is actually managing outside counsel. And so it's shifting a bit, but a lot of it is around cost and a lot of it's around change. Uh, here, let's see this one. Corporate law departments will be the primary drivers of innovation and change in the legal sector. Again, this is our largest buying <coughs> population. In 2014, 47% agreed that the corporate law departments would be the driver of change. Anyone want to take a guess if that number is higher or lower in 2017? You're saying lower. Higher. And a higher, OK. I'll stop there. I got both answers. Uh, Actually, 85% of corporate law departments think they're going to be the driver of change. They're starting to take ownership of this change cycle because they're not seeing the momentum they'd like to see from their law firms in trying to drive this change. Okay. I will tell you that in most of the work that law firms do, though, it's really not about cost. We don't have a cost problem. We have a productivity problem which is what started me on my journey with Baker McKenzie. So if you think about all the disciplines we talked about that I undertook in the legal operations sphere, they actually all apply to the law firm space as well. If you think about trying to connect to your clients, trying to be about driving change and momentum, helping to innovate and think about existing ways we're doing things better, um, all of that are the same disciplines you saw in-house that we're seeing in a law firm. OK, so why did I take the challenge? Actually, 20 years ago, actually 20, more than 20 years ago, um, I'm finishing law school, passed the bar, was practicing a little bit, and I walk into my career services office at my school. And I said, by the way, I want to do something alternative with my legal career. And they were like, what are you talking about? Right? Are you crazy? You've just spent three years, uh, passed the bar, which is a three-day exam, invested all this money. I have nothing to tell you. You should be going to practice law because that's what lawyers do. Maybe you could go work for a nonprofit. Maybe you could be a law librarian. There's a couple legal publishers. I suppose you could try that. That was it. That was the nature of the discussion. They thought I was nuts. Um, when the opportunity came to join Baker McKenzie, I said, well, this is interesting. Not a lot of people have actually done the legal operations stuff and tried to bring that discipline in-house. That opportunity presented itself on one of the largest platforms out there in the world. I said, I'm going to try it. I, tra uh, you know, I did some trailblazing early on. This seems exciting and interesting. That was one of the things that led me to kind of move over. Um, it was not an easy decision. And actually, the conversation lasted more than eight months in terms of trying to figure out what would the role be and how would I actually uh, do it and evolve um, what we're thinking at the firm. Uh, it was also a really... Uh, a lot of due diligence on my part, which, which was, was the partnership actually willing to embrace this? Is it just talk, or were there things they were putting in place to actually help make it happen? Uh, and a lot of those things were in place, which is what led me uh, to the firm today. But I want to go back to, we don't have a cost problem, um, we have a productivity problem. Because the, the reality of it is, when people are really upset about price, most law firms will say, OK, well, we'll just adjust the price. Right? And when people are really mad about bad communications, they say, well, we'll just adjust the price. Right? And when the execution has been really awful, we'll, we'll just adjust the price, because right? that'll make you happy. And when the quality of the work is really, really bad, and we're upset about it, they say, well, let's adjust the price. Do you see a problem here? We're always talking about the costs instead of actually fixing the underlying problems. And that's really what I'm spending some of my time doing here at the firm. Um, process improvements and enablers to change out there. We talked a little bit about the dynamic here of doing the right work. And so corporate law departments balance this all the time. There's this 
balancing act of people, process, and technology, which is to say that as I push down or push up on external resources, there's actually a direct impact on what happens to external resources. And so a lot of times what they're trying to do is find the right service delivery, manage the risk versus the impact on my business against the tools I have in my toolbox to get me to a place in finding that right balance. It's not easy to do. Technology is always, always changing and it's always moving. People change, so law firm, internal resources, general counsel, they're always trying to balance internal versus external because at the end of the day, it's a balancing act in terms of how do I use my limited resources to solve for my many, many problems. So one of the things I think will be helpful to you as you think about how to prioritize the work that is done within a corporate law department is on the left side, think about risk. What is my tolerance for risk on this particular thing I'm doing? And on the bottom there is what is the impact on the competitive advantage to my organization? Why is that important? Because that's actually what resonates with your business folks. Things that are high risk and high on my competitive advantage actually was where I focused on internal resources leading through and um, trying to uh, drive the change from my people who have internal domain knowledge about my organization. It's high risk work that furthers the strategic direction of the company. Typically in that upper right quadrant, what you see is strong relationships with a few providers uh, who are having those strategic relationships with those organizations, but you have to be really careful because this is also the area where people get very complacent uh, as law firms. They figure, well, they always rely on us for that high risk, high impact stuff, and they get lazy. And so you have to watch out for that. The bottom left, where it's low risk and low competitive advantage, what do you want to do? You either want to eliminate it, not do it at all. You want to reduce the amount that you're doing, or you want to automate that or outsource it, okay? So what falls in here? Things like non-disclosure agreements. The agreements that I use when I'm having my holiday party and someone has to sign off on it, honestly, if the thing goes terribly wrong, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'm going to have to pay the restaurant or bar some fee for not showing up. Do I really need to be wasting law department resources on that? On the upper right, things like M&A, IP, data privacy, all that stuff's really important, but actually it depends on what company you're in. So the last company I was at, Archer Daniels Midland, uh, we sold corn. We sold lots of corn, uh, soybeans, oils, ingredients, things like that. If someone came to us, and many did, and said, you know what, GDPR is actually really important, right? You have to be, take it very seriously. You have to do it really well. You know what I would say? Actually, it's not that important. If I do GDPR perfect, if I do it really, really well, where do you think it falls on this quadrant for my competitive advantage, right? Okay, there's some risk, but it probably falls squarely in the middle, right? I can do GDPR perfectly well. It doesn't help me sell more corn. It doesn't help me do a darn thing that's helping to drive my business. And so when we were trying to provide, uh, find providers to help us through that, we were looking for someone who actually understood what the actual impact was on my business and try to drive solutions that had to deal with the impact uh, the, the impact on my competitive advantage, or at least be real enough to understand it wasn't going to drive business and it was something I had to take care of. And so we had to price it and size it accordingly. And this is a good matrix to think about when you're trying to drive uh, and think about solutions for your different organizations. Because if I wasn't Archer Daniels Midland, but I was Google, I guarantee you that GDPR would be up in that upper right-hand corner, and so it's a much different discussion, right? And you have to understand that when we talk about markets in the, in the world out there, a market isn't a place you could actually go to. There is no such thing as the market. When you talk about markets, you're actually talking about coalescing around buyer needs and what do those buyers need from you in order to solve for the problems that they're facing. Being very uh, demand-driven, uh, not supply-driven. Most law firms are very supply-driven. They say, we've got a bunch of hammers, we're looking for a bunch of nails. Right? Instead of asking, what is it that you actually need or want? Okay. Mr. Serfoza, anyone know who that is? Probably not. Uh, he was a leader of um, Milan during the time of Da Vinci. <clears throat> da Vinci was looking for a job, and he wrote a letter to this uh, leader of Milan. He said, look, I'm really good at a bunch of stuff. 
I can build bridges. I understand waterways. I build cannons. I build armored vehicles. I built a helicopter. And I'm really pretty good at anatomy as well and have done a bunch of stuff. Right? In the 11th paragraph, so he wrote an 11 paragraph letter to Mr. Serfosa. He said, oh, by the way, I can also paint. Um, now, I don't think painting for da Vinci is a throwaway, but he used it as a throwaway um, in what he was talking about. I find it interesting that when you think about people who innovated in a whole number of areas, a lot of their expertise actually comes from very cross-functional expertise and very cross-functional experiences in life. Um, da Vinci himself actually didn't value some of the creative side of what he did or some of the, the, um, <clears throat> the more um, thoughtful things he did on the innovation side and actually used it as a throwaway. And that's actually a real letter. There's also a bunch of other people, right? There's some commonality of other innovators out there, right? This woman here, Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace was actually one of the first computer programs in the 1800s, found a machine out there and said, look, I think I could get this to actually um, do some interesting computing stuff for me and wrote one of the first algorithms. She was the daughter of Lord Byron, who was a writer. This guy here, Benjamin Franklin, one of the first founders, actually wasn't actually formally educated, um, but did a whole lot of inventions, right? Helped discover electricity, built some bifocals, Albert Einstein, did anyone actually know Albert Einstein was a very uh, accomplished vi violinist uh, and actually used music as a way to kind of free his mind on a lot of things? Uh, and Steve Jobs, dropped out from college, actually took a calligraphy course, and based on that calligraphy course, um, used that experience to help tr build true type fonts. Um, all of those innovators actually have something in common, which is they used experiences across their whole life um, as they were trying to innovate and evolve the things they were evolving. I would argue, actually, as lawyers of the future, that's something we all need to do. We have to actually expand our legal knowledge and our legal expertise beyond the doctrinal knowledge. And we talk about this. I know you guys talked about the T-shaped lawyers. But the real lawyers of the future are going to be those legal integrators. And this is from uh, Professor Henderson, who I think is coming next week. But legal innovator, integrators talk about pil pulling in lawyers and non-lawyers to solve the problems that are facing corporate law departments today. Legal specialists, which are subject or task-based, non-legal specialists who are dealing with things like data, process software, technology, but also smart enough to have domain knowledge enough to actually reach up to those bespoke lawyers who have that expertise I'm looking for. The true kind of renaissance person who actually is going to survive and continue to thrive in the legal marketplace today actually comes from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, before law school, I did a lot of different things, right, uh, like all of us. And tapping into those things are actually very beneficial to the journey we're all on. And here we are talking about the acumen and competencies required by legal integrators. Um, okay, so let's see what the survey talks about in terms of degrees obtained. So in 2008, 25% were MBA, 35% were JD. It uh, actually shifted a lot in 2013 uh, to 17% had JDs, 36% had MBAs. And in 2017, 34% had MBAs and 18% had JDs. So we're starting to see a trend that the law department operations folks out there are actually coming from backgrounds that are more business focused than legal focused, which is why a lot of what you're doing is very important because you're tying together the legal domain knowledge um, of what you have to also some of the business acumen of actually running the business of law. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about value. There's a saying that being valuable is a lot like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you probably aren't. Um, law departments in the world actually do two things, two things only. They call it a lot of different stuff. Law departments do two things. They either create value for their organizations or they preserve value for their organizations. That's all they do. So if I go out and get an IP, 
um, something, um, a patent for them, if I do IP work for them, if I do an M&A, um, if I bring someone on board through an employment contract, I'm actually creating value for that organization. I'm helping to drive the business forward. On the preservation side, if I have a regulator wanting to give me a root canal through an investigation, if I have people suing me, if there's risk I'm doing, dealing with, I'm actually preserving value. A lot of this is very important because it takes what you're spending and doing and turns it from a cost to an investment when you're talking to your business folks. Um, and also, you have to talk their same language. So one year when I was at Archer Daniels Midland, in one year I was able to reduce legal spend by $22 million. Okay? That's a lot of millions. I would take it. I'd be very interested in that. But for a company that makes $70 billion, $22 million wasn't very interesting to our business folks. I was kind of surprised by that. Um, Archer Daniels Midland, in a lot of their businesses, is a 3% margin business. So what we did is, instead of talk about the $22 million, what I said was, in order for you to find another $22 million in this organization, you'd actually have to sell $785 million worth of more corn. All of a sudden, that started to resonate because they're thinking, for me to make or find $785 million more worth of corn would probably take me a month and a half or two months of my productivity, blah, 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 blah. And so a lot of what the law departments need to get good at, a lot of what we need to do in our legal service delivery is tell different stories with the same information because that's very important uh, as we go on the journey. A couple key points about value as you get into the world. Uh, the client defines value, not the lawyer. Um, believe me, in my day, I've seen a lot of suspender snapping, people coming to my office talking to me about just how valuable and important they are um, without knowing a darn thing about me and what drives my business. Uh, saving money is important, but value is more important than just cost savings. Okay? Sometimes the size of the footprint of the, of the law firm is important. Sometimes the speed of execution is important. Sometimes the actual experience that I'm dealing with is very important. All of that's very important. You need to know what, what really moves your buyer. Um, legal contribution is only a portion. I Hopefully we know that now. Strategic advice beyond the legal questions, that's actually your real currency with your clients. I can get legal advice anywhere. It's actually applying that legal advice um, that really drives that connection to your corporate law buyers. Uh, value, ven ver yeah. value varies depending on where you sit, who you're talking to, and the goals of the business. So don't be surprised if one minute you're talking to a legal operations person and saying it's all about cost, and you actually go to the real buyer, which is the, uh, the in-house counsel person who says, no, my focus is this. You have a conflict there in terms of what is valuable. You have to try to resolve that conflict through your conversations and how you position what you're doing. But it's very important to know who you're talking to, what are the psychographics of the people who you're buying from. Um, to, uh, you can observe a lot by watching. This is, I can't underestimate this enough. You actually have to understand the business that you're doing the work for. To understand the business, you actually have to understand one thing. How do they make money, right? What's important to them? If you understand how they make money or have an idea of how they make money, it makes that value discussion a lot easier. And then what's important gets measured, what's measured gets done. So what do I have to do? I actually have to do something around metrics and storytelling. I know you had a, a, a piece on that. But I will tell you, without data, you're just another person uh, with an opinion. And so a lot of what, what I spent time doing in-house and what we're spending time doing here is just building different metrics that tell a story, that tell a story and is very actionable. And I'll give you an example of a... Uh, uh, an illustration I used to, to, to make this point. We've all seen the dashboard of a car. And in that dashboard of a car, we see that gauges go up and down. They move all around. If you take someone who knows nothing about driving a car, you know, they might see the fuel at F for full. And they think, OK, if it's full, it's good. But they might also see the oil temperature light at full or high. And they might think, well, if full is good there, that's probably good. I should probably drive the car, right? Not a bad idea, right? Wrong. Don't do that. A lot of what the metric snapshots are all about is not only just giving the information and the data, it's telling a story, giving the information, and walking people through uh, the journey about what it is they're looking at. Another very real example is one of my first jobs in-house. <clears throat> 
uh, I was working for a gentleman who was probably one of the smartest guys I've ever worked for. He was a Supreme Court clerk. He worked for two presidents. He was an undersecretary of labor. He was a partner at a law firm, and now he was a GC at a company. A uh, lot of horsepower, right? He was also a litigator. And we were going into the CEO's office, and he had his charts, his little data. Um, and his data was just the facts, right? It was very backwards looking. It was just data points. And I said, can I ask you a question? You spent your entire, your entire life taking facts and telling a story and how to interpret that story. Why are you not doing that here with the data and you're about to walk into your boss, the CEO, and you're doing nothing with this data? You're actually having him make assumptions about the work you're doing. And he's like, I never actually thought about that way, right? This is someone with a lot of horsepower. It just wasn't in their training and their thinking. And so a lot of the metric stuff we do actually has to get us to that point. Okay. Why does this matter, right? General counsel are tired of inefficiencies. They're tired of internal credit battles. They don't like the high cost of inexperienced resources. Cost pressures will drive changes in the relationship. We have to be careful about that. And they are seeking alternative solutions. So the question is, what can we really do about it, right? <clears throat> I have some advice for you. One, get naked. Two, be a pig. And three, be kind to cats. All right, what does that mean? Need some explaining. <laughs> Number one, getting naked. There's actually a book out there by Peter Lencioni, which talks about let go of losing fear, let go of the fears about losing business, let go of the fear of being in, uh, embarrassed or feeling inferior. At its core, naked service actually boils down to the ability of a service provider, which we all are, to be vulnerable, uh, to embrace unknown levels of humility. I know it's a stretch. We're all lawyers. We can do it though. Selflessness and transparency for the actual good of the client. It's that client empathy. This is a little parable. This book is, is actually about 60 pages. You could whip through it on a delayed train from Hamburg to Frankfurt. You'd probably get through it twice. Um, by shedding these fears, you actually provide immediate value to the people you serve. You tell the kind truth and not sugarcoat the obvious. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. You got to enter your zone of discomfort with that client rather than avoid it. Stop being afraid of making mistakes because it's very important. Um, make suggestions that's, that actually stimulates thinking uh, rather than actually stifles it. Don't be afraid to ask the dumb questions. Uh, very American thing. Take the bullet for your client. Make everything about the client. Okay? That's about getting naked. Be a pig. Well, let me, let me just tell you this. Your clients actually... <clears throat> um, Next time you eat bacon and eggs for breakfast, remember this. The chicken was involved in the breakfast. The pig's actually committed to the breakfast, if you want to think about that. In the business world, we actually don't have time for chickens. We need people committed to the problems we have. I need you digging in deep, uh, trying to find the solutions for my business, understanding the constraints I have in my business. I need you absolutely 100% committed to that. That's very important. So again, be a pig, don't be a chicken. Last one, be, be kind to cats. At the end of the day, most of your clients and their bosses are like cats. Very important. Here's the thing. They need lots of stroking, and they do not like sudden moves. No surprises, right? Um, you want to be real clear about what is the scope of the work you're doing. What is the expectation they should expect? Yes, legal is kind of a funny thing. But again, if you lead them through, if you talk about the differences in those assumptions with them, what you end up having... Uh, is a more uh, cohesive relationship with that particular buyer of legal services. You can control product innovation. You can control customer in intimacy. You can control operational excellence. You can do that today. You don't need your entire organization to do that. You can do that in the work you're doing today. Let's go back to change, right? Who wants change? Everybody wants change, right? Who actually wants to... Um, who wants change, who wants to actually uh, change themselves, not many people, and who wants to lead the change, almost nobody. And that's why law firms are still out there struggling to get through this dynamic, and why corporate law departments, by the way, uh, are also struggling, because they talk about wanting change, and they chicken out, right? They say they want more alternative fee uh, arrangements, they say they want different ways of doing business, and even when you present it, they don't know how to measure it. They don't know if it's a good deal. They don't know how to actually implement or operationalize it. 
And so they chicken out. They go back to the hourly rate model. And so if you're there leading people through that, helping them through this dynamic, what actually ends up happening is we will end up being the driver of change, and that's one of the focuses of many that I have here. Leadership buy-in is actually a prerequisite um, to change. It's not an outcome. It's a prerequisite. Okay, in the corporate law department, much easier. I actually need the buy-in from one person, the GC, right? In a law department, oh, man, I need approval from the owners of the business. And at Baker McKenzie, for example, over 600 owners of the business, much harder. Um, by the way, <clears throat> reporting directly to the GC, in, nine, in 2008, 76% of legal operations folks reported directly to the GC. In 2017, 59% did. Okay? The actual influence that a lot of the legal operations folks have, again, we talked about that big tranche of capability. It's actually going down. They're getting further away from the leadership and buy within those corporate law departments. So you got to be careful about what we're doing there. Um, has anyone seen the J-curve of change? Probably not. Uh, let me just say one thing. When you talk about the current state on the left and the desired state on the right, most people actually think that it goes that red line. It goes from the current state to the desired state. Everything's going to be awesome, and we're going to change. It'll be really cool, right? Um, what actually happens in most cases is the blue line, is that we go through change. There's this big period of uh, disruption, and we get an impact, uh, inverse, um, adverse impact on the performance. It's called the trough of despair. Most people typically end up giving up on change in that trough of despair. Why you need leadership buy-in or why you need clients who are actually willing, ready, and able to drive you through change is because it's leadership that actually drives you through that trough of despair through the desired state. But most projects typically fail in that trough of despair. It happens all the time. Um, for every $1 you spend on technology on a project, you actually need to spend $10 on people and change management for your projects. Most people don't think about it that way. They think about, let me just open the magic box of technology. It'll do its thing. It'll be awesome. Wrong. You're pushing on a piece of string. It's never going to do what you want it to do. You actually have to invest 10 times that on people and change management. Um, the other thing is, Right? A lot of people are just too damn busy, right? They're too busy doing their every day to actually think about and drive effective change. I used to say all the time, they're too busy chopping wood to sharpen their own ax. No, I can't. I'm just too busy. I can't do it. You have to drive that change because it's very important. Um, <clears throat> here's the aggregate impact of marginal gains over time, right? With just a 1% change over time, you see marginal and exponential improvements. By the way, with bad behavior or 1% worse, you also, you also see exponential uh, changes um, in behavior over time. Little chart for you. So if you are, um, how long should you actually work on a routine or, or task to be more efficient before you actually are spending more time than you save? And so for here, for example, <coughs> right, um, if I am working on something, how much time do I shave off? If I do something 50 times a day and shave off five months, guess what? You should be willing to invest nine months of time to actually solve that problem because that's what's going to get you the gains, right? Now, if I'm doing something for one second, one time a day, uh, or 50 times a day and I shave off one second, I should de dedicate a day. What this does is actually give you some scope about how you prioritize the things that will drive real change in your organization. <clears throat> okay. So Darwin said this, it's not the strongest of species that survives, it's the, mo the most intelligent, it's actually the one that's most responsive to change. Very important, right? But see, the new Kodak moment is that moment when you realize the customer behaviors and preferences have changed so dramatically that it's actually too late to change. Kodak actually had the patent and had the invention for a digital camera in the 60s and did not want to cannibalize the only revenue they knew and understood, which was film. And you know what happened in the digital camera space. It ate them for lunch, and they are almost non-existent. OK, we talk a lot about innovation, so I want to touch upon that. Uh, and I am nearing towards the end here. Um, 
Traditional wisdom says, look, at innovation, and I'm on the innovation committee, and there's a lot of innovation discussions that happen here. Successful innovation really depends on providing an environment where there's a tolerance for failure, a willingness to experiment. It's safe to speak up, and it's highly collaborative and non-hierarchical, right? We all wear hoodies, and we have a good time. We drink some beverages at the counter. Actually, Harvard Business Review just came out with a study on innovation, and let's talk a little bit about what they found. When they talk about real, real innovation, is uh, tolerance for failure? No, actually, it's no tolerance for incompetence. Okay? When they talk about it's a willingness to experiment, actually, real innovation and in the case studies they did is really about highly disciplined based on the potential learning value of what I'm going to gain from that expertise. Psychologically safe, wrong. They actually say it's brutally candid and it has to be a two way street. Speak truth to power. That it's collaborative? No, it's actually really about individual accountability. And lastly, lack of hierarchy. Um, um, real innovation is not about lack of leadership. So you have to lead people through the change. You have to lead them through the innovation. All right, let me end with some lessons learned about change. Let me lead uh, about some of the things I've implemented at different companies. And yes, the godfather of legal operations. I'll tell the story later, perhaps. But let's talk about some lessons learned with one of the greatest movies ever, The Godfather. OK. Um, leave the gun, take the cannolis. Look, at when you're going through change, keep your priorities straight. But also, don't forget to treat yourself and your team after a job well done. Uh, very important. Uh, you can hand, have my answer now if you'd like. My final offer is this, nothing. OK? Never get bullied into making decisions that you don't agree with. Even if it means offending someone uh, who's trying to intimidate you. Who's going to try to intimidate you? Your clients, your customers, your bosses, partnership, um, other folks out there within your organizations. You really want to be making sure that you're doing decisions that you can agree with and implement. Um, among reasonable men, problems of business can always be solved. And so when trying to solve a, trickly pr a tricky problem, leave it alone. Come back to it later. A solution will always present itself. We go to the mattresses. <coughs> when faced with an imminent problem or threat, don't give up. Keep pressing forward. Remember the ultimate goals and objectives of why you're there. Am I doing value creation or value preservation? I want to know what I'm doing there. Uh, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, OK? If you're not familiar with the naysayers and negative people about your projects and people in your organization, uh, you won't be able to actually anticipate what they're going to do, and you won't be able to plan accordingly. You'll want to bring in the naysayers early on when you're trying to drive and implement change. Very important. Uh, it's a Sicilian message. It means Luca Brazzi sleeps with the fishes. Symbolism can be very clever, but remember, always be clear, ABC. When we get in that trough of despair, people have to be really clear about what is the ultimate goal of what you're doing, because if I don't have the ultimate goal of what I'm doing, it makes it very hard to, to get the buy-in. Um, he's been dying from the same heart attack for the last 20 years. Don't cry wolf too often, by the way, or people will actually doubt your sincerity. If you have problems or issues, you have to escalate them with your clients. You have to escalate them in your organization. But you have to be careful about how you package and how often you do that. Um, a lawyer with a briefcase can steal more than 1,000 men with guns, one of my favorites. Um, but finesse is actually sometimes more important than muscle. And finesse about how you manage your political the politics of your organization, how you manage those relationships, very important. Uh, don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again, ever. Keep a unified front at all times in what you're doing. Voice your concerns, but you have to do them in private, uh, and you have to do them in a very constructive way. Uh, this is not business, it's personal. Don't get too sentimental or emotional about what you're trying to do and when you're making decisions, very important. Um, and look it, I mean, I want someone very good to plant the gun. I don't want my brother coming out of there with empty-handed, right? So when delegating important tasks for others, make sure you've covered all the bases and you haven't left anything to chance. And lastly, look at someday that day may never come, but I may call on you for a service of me. So I hope you've enjoyed our time. But build a powerful community. That's what we're doing here. Helping others, you actually will receive help as well and help drive the change. So um, questions? Yes. So one question slash thought. 
Um, do you not think the way to drive change in a law firm then in relation to finding alternative pricing strategies or alternative solutions on, on how we engage with clients is to actually pause and say to, say to the lawyers, we're not upping your hourly rates this next financial year. If you want to utilize or you want to realize more money, find alternative ways to bring that, those funds. It's an interesting question about raising rates. <clears throat> um, actually, I think raising rates provides some optionality by which we can deal with the complexities of buying legal. Um, in an organization like ours where we have people in multiple jurisdictions, without that ability to adjust discounts or adjust um, rates according to the market pressures, leaves me pretty flat-footed. It doesn't leave me lots of options. Um, and so rates is one piece of it. And the bulk, of this, uh, the bulk, as you saw, of legal spend is actually still pegged to the hourly rate. I do think ultimately the way to go and to get to where we want to get to on value-based billing is around packaging a bunch of service lines or things that people want uh, and delivering it for a flat fee or a fixed fee on that. Here's the problem. Until I figure out how to manage and deal with the compensation issues in a lot of firm, right, and what people are incentivized by, it's actually really, really hard to get people to change their behavior because they're doing this alternative fee structure, but they're actually still tying it to a billable hour. And so we keep tying the value based on the practitioner doing the work instead of the actual work, the service I'm offering. And so a lot of the work that we're looking at is really thinking differently about our allocations within the firm, thinking differently about what compensation models can you put in place that make these discussions more meaningful, um, to really think about what are the incentives that we should put in place to drive the behaviors we want. And the problem is, in a law department or a law firm, I actually still have to keep the business running while I'm driving the change. So you're going to see this duopoly sit and live for a long, long time. But I do think raising rates is part of the equation because I have to actually have that optionality to actually drive the change I'm looking for. Yes? Uh, which technology particularly are you most excited about as, as a driver for this type of change you're looking to enact? What technology am I most excited about? Um, <clears throat> there are a couple technologies that are expanding the idea of what, um, what it means to be doing enterprise legal management out there. Typically, enterprise legal management used to be, in a law department setting, used to be all about managing spend and managing matters. Um, now a lot of the tools are expanding out beyond uh, just managing those two things and managing all the other processes that I'm doing out there, whether it's government gifting and hosting, claims intake, interaction with my board of directors, all those things that we tend to do as knowledge workers in email, those technologies have those collaboration pieces built in. That, to me, is the most interesting thing. The, the reality of legal technology, I will tell you, uh, is that it's still a very, very fragmented market. So four years ago, if you looked at Angel uh, uh, Law Angels, which was a group of folks who were invent uh, investing in legal technology, they were actually investing in about 100 companies. Two years later, they were investing in 400-plus companies. Right? The market's still very fragmented, still fixed with a lot of point solutions. And so we still have some maturing to do in that space. The manner management or the ELM, enterprise legal management space, is probably one of the most mature, and they're finding their ways through that. Um, AI, I think, is uh, not a technology, but as part of technology is interesting. I will tell you, though, a lot of talk of AI, most people aren't doing real AI. Uh, so the promise of that has yet to really evolve. I'd like to see where that goes, because I think that will be very interesting. So. Can I ask a question real quick? Yes. Um, I know that for the past seven days, I believe you have been in five different cities. Yeah. And I'm just curious because you, you said change is hard and you say um, keep a unified front and all that. But can you, um, is it different in a firm than it was in house? And can you speak to some, because I want people to have realistic ideas of what this kind <clears throat> of job is um, that, you're, that you're leading there. And maybe you can speak a bit to that. Yeah. Um... First of all, one of the things that, did, that surprised me was the nature of problems that law firms are struggling with are actually of the same texture and feel of the problems law departments are facing um, in terms of reducing friction, connection with clients, uh, trying to show value, 
all of those things. So I thought that was uh, very interesting. It is a tad harder in, uh, in the law firm, one, because of that incentive structure we talked about. If you think about trying to drive change or cannibalize a business where you're actually pretty successful at it in your, in your organization, it's real scary to tell a business, hey, think differently because in the long run, you're going to be better off. So they tend to do very incremental steps around that. Uh, whereas in a corporate law department, like I said, one person I have to talk about change, generally the CFO or the CEO is beating on you to do that change anyways. And so the risks are a lot lower. Uh, and so I find that to be a lot harder. So a lot of what I've been doing the last couple of weeks over here in Europe is actually talking to those different offices about what are their pain points, what are the things that motivate them, because if I understand the motivations and the challenges, I can get to the root causes of why some of those behaviors happen. So that is, that is very much a challenge. That's one. Number two is, um, at the risk of sounding a little braggadocious, I was a pretty sophisticated buyer of legal services, um, and I was ready and, and willing and able to kind of take on and be an early adopter in a lot of this stuff, right? Um, a lot of my peers and former colleagues on the legal operations side, they talked a lot about it, but when push came to shove to actually do some of it, they lose the stomach for it. Um, and so I really didn't anticipate that people would be as hesitant around some of those things as they were, um, or that there'd be that much friction. Because again, for all the talk about the change they want, it's actually very, very difficult to get them to buy off on that because they lack capability, they lack capacity, they lack timing, all sorts of things uh, that drive that. And so that's why we're trying to build some of these other infrastructure pieces to help lead them through that uh, challenge. So I would say those are some of the things that are a little harder. Yes? Um, some of the stuff, for example, knowledge management, it requires a fundamental change in sort of culture so that people actually embrace it and actually write down everything everything they do. Do you have any tips on, on how to convince people to do that? Because it's very non-rewarding work. And um, It is. Um, <clears throat> I have some general theories about technology adoption and implementation. Um, one of them is this, that um, the minute you ask someone to do an unnatural act with technology, they'll never do it. If it doesn't mirror or follow the way they actually do work, if it doesn't meet them where they actually are, that technology is doomed to fail because people are just not going to do that. And so when you're doing your implementations or when you're rolling out those types of things like KM or other types of uh, technologies we see out there, I always try to drive people to have it be natural acts, a natural extension of the way they do work. Because if I'm able to do that, the adoption happens more, um, more effectively. Now, there are costs to doing that, though, right? So maybe you don't get the 100% solution with the KM, but I get 80% of it. But that 80% actually will give you exponential change in what you're trying to do. And you have to be willing to make that, that um, um, you have to be willing to make that trade-off when you're doing technology. So it was, um, it, it really is about trying not to do unnatural acts. Because the minute you do that, the minute you have someone doing work in one thing and you tell them to stop and go to something else and log into something without them having any appreciation for what it's going to do, you've lost. Uh, so think about that as you roll out different technology and in terms of how effective it will be or can be. Yes? So, um, this is going to be a little bit awkward, but could you please elaborate a little bit more on the getting naked part <laughs> in the sense, um, is that we should or try to be transparent and actually humility is something very good, um, but usually we are taught that that we should be the top dog at the table, or that we should not show our weaknesses. How, how can you please elaborate a little bit more on that? Because I found, I found that pretty interesting. Yeah. Look at a lot of what the, the book expounds upon, and I, it's been a number of years since I've read it, but it's when you go and communicate with your clients, a lot of times you're being brought to the table to solve very complex problems, right? And those complex problems have many, many dimensions to them. And in order to actually get to the point where you're providing the real advice, you actually have to show some vulnerability and say, I actually don't know everything yet. Let me hear your perspective. Let's get diversity of thought. But while you're doing that, you're trying to formulate your answer. Really what they're paying you for is not the answer. They're paying you for the mental rigor around, how do I think about this problem? What are the inputs I need to get you the outputs you need? Most of us tend to walk into a room and say, let me put up that wall, assume I know everything, and what you have oftentimes is a misalignment between the solution and the real problem, 
because you were afraid to ask those questions or be vulnerable with your client. That's the one piece. The other piece is the book also talks a lot about the relationship. They talk a lot about when you go into a client, act as if you've already been hired. Act as if you don't worry about the, yes, we have to worry about the engagement letter, so not saying that, but don't worry about the mechanics of, of being a solution provider to them. Start to be a solution provider to them. That is a very real part about uh, um, that parable about getting naked. Is really about act as if you've already been hired. Dig in and be that partner. Be genuine with that client because um, you tend to build those connections. At the end of the day, those people are calling outside expertise because they're dealing with really tricky problems that internally they don't know how to, how to move, so they're looking for a trusted advisor in a lot of that. Any more questions? Oh, yes. there we are. Uh, you mentioned incentives. Um, do you have already some ideas how to do it? I, I could imagine that associates would be more open to, to raise their productivity and change the processes because it means they will go home earlier. But how do you incentivize partners? Because for them, it's something coming on top on their daily business. Look, at my conversations with partners has is, is actually been pretty refreshing. They understand how the business model is broken um, and how that if, unless we actually change the way we think about rewarding the behaviors, the behaviors generally won't change. And so a lot of times those incentives come in many different shapes and sizes. So a lot of times what we're trying to do when we're talking about incentives with the partners is what are some of the things that we could build structurally amongst uh, the inner workings of the law firm that drive to greater profitability, that measure the things that are going to be more meaningful longer term uh, for the organization, help future-proof the organization. A lot of that has to do with the nature and structure of the law firm as it is today. What were you trying to accomplish with the incentive structures you built? Um, some of the incentive structures we built, uh, hi Jay, how are you? Welcome. <coughs> um, have actually been in place for 10 years, which is when we had a very different model at the law firm than we do today. Um, the reality is those incentives actually have to hit not only around uh, at the partner level, but also at the associate level to try to drive that. And so if you keep tying that to an hourly rate, if you keep tying that, calling it different things, but still rewarding people in the same way um, at, at its core or at its fundamental level, um, you tend to see very slow uh, and a lot of fits and starts in that. I don't know if you want to add something. Is that why you came up front or are you just saying hi? Oh, okay. Well, I can certainly add to it if you want me to. Jay, our, yeah, please add to it about incentives. Yeah, I want to step back and just add some commentary. So Come on come over here. here. Come here. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good <laughs> to see you all again. Um, I, I just want to add that, you know, we often talk about the incentive structure and how it's important to innovate as something that, you know, we have to do as a service to the industry or to clients. Um, and I just want to point out, the legal industry is not a morality play. It's uh, Law firms are commercial concerns. They're going concerns. It's a for-profit enterprise. Um, and I think the, the trick is to align client and firm interests so that both parties have commercial incentive to behave in ways that are rational. Um, I think the market forces are dictating that the old legacy one-to-one -one service model is just not going to work with the budget pressures that are placed on corporate legal. And there is absolutely business commercial incentive for law firms to innovate and create service models that scale the expertise of the lawyer. And then so we have to ensure that we're rewarding lawyers who contribute to that effort meaningfully. Um, and I think we have to engage clients in dialogue so that they are rewarding firms who make meaningful, lasting, substantial contributions to the way that they buy and consume legal services. And then so that is a uh, long-winded way of saying uh, pricing is definitely a lover yeah. um, because we have to make sure we're pricing services in a way that incentivizes uh, practitioners to work differently um, because clients are incentivizing firms that deliver services differently. There we are. Thank you. I'm not sure I can possibly keep you from pizza anymore. Yeah. If I ever want you to come back to Butzerius again, I would, do we have very urgent questions? I'm, you will be around for a moment to, uh, yep, to answer those. Yep, we'll be here. I'll okay. be here. Jay that be looks here. good. So this, this leaves one act to me. Um, I realized probably the only thing that I got and you don't is um, a Butzerius tie. Ah. I, I think it would go perfectly with what you're wearing. 
Um, but Excellent. I have a feeling that sometimes uh, they force you to wear a suit too. Oh, they do indeed. And um, we give this tie here. Uh, typically, it's our very smart way. We're young school, 20 years of age. It's our very smart way of sticking us to people who we think really drive change and make a difference. Um, and so please uh, give a bit, little bit of your personal brand to us and wear it, take a picture, yeah. and we show it. There Thank you, you very much. Thank you for having me. There you go. There you go.